from Washington, D.C., this is the Beyond the Dumbbells Show. Your source of information and inspiration for living an audacious life. Audacious life. Hear interviews and social banter with special guests on Fitspiration and news from around the globe. Here are your hosts, fitness and lifestyle experts, Brian and Jenny Sweeney. Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Brian Sweeney. I'm your host today on Beyond the Dumbbells. We have actually a very special guest today. I'm super excited to introduce you to Justin Freistight. Close. <laughs> Freistight. Freistight. <laughs> okay, Justin, sorry, I butchered his name real bad. If I showed you the spelling, you'd understand why. Um, so Justin's from Heartland Home Foods out of Baltimore, and we're going to discuss today. This is a super exciting topic because we're going to get right to the heart of what most people want to ignore. Um, they don't want to acknowledge that it's out there, and they certainly don't want to acknowledge the impact on their health. Okay, so we're going to talk about food and food sourcing. Uh, this is I'm really excited about this because the first time I heard about it, it made me sick to my stomach because I just didn't really understand what I, I didn't know what I didn't know. So Justin, thank you for being on the show. Uh, Thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm really excited to be here. I love what you all are doing. Awesome. You and Jenny doing a great job. So um, tons of value. I really enjoyed your last episode. You know? <laughs> great. We got one listener. So it's, it's going in the right <laughs> direction. Um, now, Let's go background on you. So just a little bit about you. I know you're in the family business. This is actually not just a job for you. It's a family thing. So if you can give us like this a synopsis, what's going on with you? What's going on with your business? And um, we're going to get a little bit after your intro, what you have to offer compared to what most consumers are bringing home. Okay. So let's go at it. What's, give us a little bit of a background on Justin and uh, his company. Sure. So um, for me personally, it started off just, you know, it looks like a good way to help people bring them healthy food. And then through the process of meeting all the farmers and the sourcing and the supply chains and learning um, just everything in this industry and seeing how deep the dive could go, just getting really obsessed with learning everything there is to know about commercial farming, the difference between private companies, the publicly traded, you know, just, it's a whole mess. But anyways, sure. so it's like you get real specialized in one thing and you just want to, bring that value to everybody else. So um, that's what I'm here to do. And now your, your dad started the company, right? Did yeah, you- it was uh, originally a company called Dutterers out of Baltimore um, since 1939. And he oh, actually, wow. yeah, he bought the company in 2003 and kind of flipped the model on its head. So he's a complete health nut, um, competitive bodybuilder at um, turning 60 this year and still uh, getting up on stage. So that's um, fantastic. He basically used uh, the platform, the business that he bought to source the cleanest, safest, healthiest food you can get. It, well, I, I imagine he eats a lot of chicken. So it's probably a good thing <laughs> to own a company where you don't have to go out and go to the store. You're probably saving a penny there anyway. Um, but your, your dad, that was one of the things that appealed me to the company was that I knew that you guys had fitness and nutrition in your blood. Um, so that, that already opened the door as far as our relationship and how I started um, listening more to what you had to say. You didn't come at me as a sales guy. Now, compared to what most consumers are bringing home and with what you guys do, now, you had talked about you're extremely studious about your topic. You understand uh, everything that goes on behind the scenes, which means you also can differentiate between what you guys offer, what you've seen in the industry, because you're not actually a farmer. You actually just deliver top quality stuff to consumers, um, much in a way that a grocery store would or a, a warehouse, whatever. But what people are buying now and what they're bringing home, it's pretty different, right? Compared to yeah, we, yeah, we consider ourselves experts in sourcing. So there's lots of options. I mean, the first thing that people just need to understand is if they're able to mass produce it and send it out to a grocery store chain, I mean, that's going to be a completely different operation than an independent farmer. So unfortunately, there, there's really never going to be access you know, people say all the time, well, Amazon bought Whole Foods. Are you guys worried? No. It's a different <laughs> they're never, Yeah, they're never going to be able to scale quality food on, on the level that we do in this micro sourcing, you know, where I can call the owner of uh, our grass-fed beef farm, talk to Matt Meyer about, you know, what's going on. I mean, that's not going to happen when you go to a grocery store. You're using the Glom model. Now, can you set the stage? So, Where's the industry going and how long, how long have you personally been doing this? 15 years? Um, so I've been personally um, 10 years. 10 years. Business for 15, yeah. And since you've started, have you seen, is the industry getting better or is it getting worse? It's definitely getting worse. Um, I think the main, the main thing that's not on anybody's radar 
is the World Trade Organization. The WTO is much more powerful than the USDA and the FDA. So you've got oh, wow. multi-billion dollar lobbying that are just crushing things like country of origin on packaging and loopholes like that. So as far as having getting, to put that stuff on there. Yeah. Or even, um, so now if it says, um, product of the USA, as long as it was packed here, it can say product of the USA. <laughs> well, wait a minute. So beef can come from overseas and it's a product Correct. of USA. Correct. So oh. you got to give, uh, you know, Wegmans a little bit of credit. At least they awesome. put on their grass fed beef product that it comes from Uruguay down in South America. So at least they're being honest about it. But People aren't paying attention to that though. If they see USDA on it, they're going to think it's a U.S. product. Right. Yeah. And, and the, actually it's the opposite. Most of the USDA certified organic products are coming from overseas. Okay. So I thought I had a, gr a handle on what we were dealing with and I, now I'm, I'm really, <laughs> I'm really <laughs> upset because sometimes I have to sneak out and eat other things at other places and I'm like, Oh, it says USDA on the menu. I'm, I know I'm getting the good stuff. That's terrible. Okay, so, so the past couple of years, what you're saying is that due to the due to the WTO and due to the the strength and power of some of the lobbying organizations, that what we once had, if it might have been okay ten years ago, now because of regulation, or I should say deregulation or loopholes, the product that's coming to the table is worse. Right. And it's also the, the way the system works because the USDA is not doing any of, of these certifications. So everything's contracted out. So in theory, the USDA has got a great overarching system of what it should be. But then you really have to look into the quality of the contractor who's supposed to be doing the certifying to see what the, the quality level of that product actually is. So it is certifying sourced out. That's not government certification. That can be independent contractor, private civilian doing that. Um, yeah, exactly. So I have an example awesome. here. Um, so, I mean, everybody's looking for this little green label it says, you know, USA organic. It says organic. I can see it. Yep. Right. So what you have to do is go to the back. I can pull it in here if you can see it. So this is a product of the Philippines, you know, USA certified it. organic, which is actually pretty good because at least it's one country. You'll, you'll look at the back of some of these things and it'll list five countries. So they don't even know what country it's coming from. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but but people think since they see the little green um, certified organic on the front that it's good to go. Right. And then uh, well, what you have to look at on the back. So if you can see right there, it says certified organic by QAI. So that's the contractor. And that stands for Quality Assurance International. Okay. So it's an international company that's basically vetting. Because all it is is an interview process. They're going to interview a farm and say, oh, are you using GMOs? Are you doing this? And Oh, that, but it's that, not very, it's that's not the extent of it. Right. Oh, great. So it's basically from all the data I've gathered from the quality farmers, it's basically an honor system. And a lot of these guys are just not going to pay the USDA for their certification when they have a quality product. And they're not going to charge you 30% more just sure. to use that label. Well, we're talking mostly about produce and farm raised things, but coffee is another big one. I know that when you get into organic coffee or not, uh, some of those smaller farmers that actually are producing better product, they can't compete because of the licensing costs. So you might be buying something that's got the certification that's not really very good because of a bad inspector. And then you've got the good product on the small end that can't afford that fake certification and you think you're drinking bad stuff. But no wonder people are confused, right? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like, you know, for people that don't shop through us, you know, where I just want to give you, you know, the best options. I mean, buy something local. It doesn't need to be organic. I mean, do you, do you want the certified organic stuff that's coming from Mexico or do you want to buy it from somebody who just raised it up the street? You know, you, you've, got just, to, you've got to take the time to find out though. I mean, if you're just rolling in and pulling something off the shelf, you don't know what you're getting. Um, kind of as a, as a, as a follow-up question. So we talked about whether or not we're better or worse in the industry, but what about the consumers? Is it a more dangerous time for them to consume most of this food? I mean, what, what do you believe that the health risks are? We talk about safe and there's a lot of talk in the, um, the news and there's that fear factor about hormones impacting development of kids, impacting um, the endocrine system and the hormones that are affected as we age. Um, are we safer as consumers now because of all these kind of wonky regulations and bad quality assurance people? I mean, what, what do you guys see as, because I know one of your mottos, motto is that you want to actually change the industry. You guys are trying to move in that direction where you want to make a, an inf a difference in people's health. Yeah, the, uh, the loophole labeling, it just gets worse and worse. 
So we, we kind of talk about our never ever program. We're trying to create kind of our own standard of what quality means because everybody's conditioned to go to the grocery store and shop for one of two things. You only get two choices, the natural stuff or the organic stuff. Right. And there's problems with both of them. So what we're trying to do is cover the entire spectrum. So it's not just the farming because that's really what organic is. Even if everything was done perfectly and certified organic, it leaves that farm. It goes to a processor and a packer. And if you're not using preservatives and antibiotics and all that stuff, there's a lot of margin for error in supply chains. So that's awesome. why you're getting so many recalls on organics. And, and then the natural side really only covers after processing. So you can do whatever you want in farming. And then as long as you don't add anything to it, you got a natural product. So <laughs> do, now do you, so you touched on a good subject there. Are most recalls, are they because of the production or because of the farming? Um, I would say it's a combination of everything. I mean, E. coli in specific with the, uh, the fact that, you know, organic fertilizer is manure. I mean, that's how E. coli is getting into vegetables. Fantastic. So it's like you don't want synthetic fertilizer because there's chemicals and issues with that. But then on the other side, if the organic isn't, isn't being um, done correctly and, and being verified and flash freezing is a big thing, um, vacuum okay. sealing, because when you vacuum seal, aerobic bacteria can't grow. So you got fresh stuff on shelves and preservatives and all kinds of things to avoid all these issues and people get sick. I mean, it's uh, something that it's really sad and that's what we're trying to eliminate by covering the farming, the processing, steam cleaning facilities, not using harsh chemicals and then um, BPA free cryovac. I mean, you got organic products in grocery stores that are sitting in chemical packaging. Sitting in BPA. That's, we just did a show about that. So awesome. Um, now, as the consumer, especially when you're talking about big powered lobbyists and organizations with a lot more spending dollars than what people can fight against, do you think that we're empowered as consumers? Where, where would I want to go to actually learn some, some of the stuff that you're telling us now? Is it only insider information or is there one or two resources that we can go to to just kind of keep up on this stuff? Because what you're giving us now, it, most of this is new to me. Yeah, there's a lot of great books. Um, Plant Paradox is, is one of my favorite books just because it just gives you so much insight to a different way of looking at things. And even though they're basically, I don't agree with everything. I mean, you're never going to read a book that you agree with everything in it. Sure. But uh, yeah, I mean, they're going to tell you not to eat meat, which I don't agree with that. And I think <laughs> that a lot of these studies that, that come out that are saying, you know, beef's going to do this to you. Well, I don't know if it's really the beef or what commercial farming has done to that. That's causing the health issues. So sometimes these stats are taken out of context and, and used to come to conclusions that I just don't agree with. Sure. They're, they're, they're biased. I mean, and, and that makes sense. If you're trying to prove a point and I'm going to write a book to prove my point. Now, what about watch lists? Is there any uh, websites or anything current that someone can go and just kind of catch current relevant information instead of something dated like a book? Um, that's a great question. I'm going to have come, to get back to you on that one. That's cool. I'll come back to it. Um, I kind of surprised you with that one. <laughs> okay. So, I'm John Jay Consumer. Um, I don't know about you yet. I don't have access to you, but I'm going, I'm going to go shopping for the week. What should I be paying attention to? You brought up the USDA label. Um, you brought up that it can say product of the USA, but it's actually the meat source from somewhere else. Did you, I don't want to get into brand names or people that we need to avoid just to kind of keep this friendly, but is there anything that the consumer, if I'm walking into the grocery store, look for this on the label or don't buy it? Yeah, I'm uh I'm basically looking for things like, uh, you know, terminology, like when you're buying your eggs, don't worry about cage free, free range, all that's the same. Um, you're looking for pasture raised, you know, actually in a pasture. Um, and so, some of these labels will give you, you know, how many square feet the chicken has. You know, so I'm looking for some sort of details that just shows me that at least it's probably better than the other stuff. Okay. So you're choosing the best of the worst. Yeah. I mean, cause at the end of the day, you're, unless you know the farmer, you really don't know anything. And that's, that, that's the great thing about what you get from us is we actually do. So, um, in, in the story, you're just trying to do the best you can kind of like, um, the oil example I just gave like this brand, what I'm looking for is not the USDA organic. I'm looking for the fact that all of this olive oil comes from California, single state source. Gotcha. It's very, it's verified by the California olive oil council. So some separate organization that's 
giving credibility outside of that little green USDA label. Fantastic. And they'll both be on the back. Yep. There's going to be all kinds of, of data on the back. And if it's missing that stuff, it's probably not a good thing. Okay. Um, all right. So now if I'm going to a farmer's market um, or the butcher, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have a, a small town butcher, you can actually talk to the guy that's doing some of the processing. Are small farmers, local farmers, do they have the money to do all the kind of funky stuff that the big farmers are doing as far as the hormones and the bad producing? And uh, is, if I want to ask a butcher a question, what do I want to ask him? If it's assumed that it's a local source. Um, I mean, I'd basically be asking, you know, what was the breed of this animal? Just considering, especially when it comes to beef, that there's over 600 different breeds out there. Because at the end of the day, yes, you want a clean product, but you want a good eating experience too. And so some of these breeds are just inedible. And that's why you'll hear people, oh, I got a, I got a side of beef from a local farmer. It was great. And then I went back and got a side of beef and, it was, and I, I couldn't even eat it. So um, breeding, I, all kinds of things. Yeah. Okay. There's 600 different types of beef? Yeah. It's like dogs and cats. I mean, how many breeds are there? So, okay. So now this is, again, I'm learning something. I'm learning something right now. What's a low end one. I'm just, just curious. I'm sure that somebody's not going to go in and ask for the breed of the cow, but what are we <laughs> talking about? I mean, so there's, is there some kind of mixed breed cheap end, you know, kind of like the, uh, the, the ghetto version of a cow. I've never, <laughs> never heard of this. So some of them are just, uh, more well marbled naturally and they're going to taste better. Some of them are, um, so tough and inedible. Like for instance, like Longhorn not not a very good tasting breed um but a great brand for a restaurant you know longhorn doesn't yeah. serve longhorn you know um, look at that so i wouldn't have guessed that either yeah it's funny okay so now do you think that the local farmers are still a, they're trying to do what the big dogs are doing by with the hormones is that still prevalent in the even if it's a lower end um i guess animal are we still talking about um they're doing the injectables they're still doing the corn fed they're still doing everything bad like the big guys uh, I would say yes and no. It's it's going to be farmer specific, you know, who you're working with. Um, you would hope that, you know, if an animal does get sick, that they do give them antibiotics and then just move them to a different program. Uh, that that's what they do at Creekstone, where uh, we get our beef from. Um, okay, we were going to come to that. Yep, good. And where they, um, we'll get back to it. So I'll, I'll make a note to come back to Creekstone. All right, dude. So. You guys, obviously, you're, you're in a business where you've got to stay sharp. You've got to stay relevant. You, if you find out that one of your farms is doing something sleight of hand or they've kind of reduced their standards, how do you guys stay current with the science? I mean, are you, are you current or do you just, once you qualify somebody, kind of like these QAI people, once you've vetted them that it's over, or who do you rely on to make sure the people you partner with, that they're still delivering the quality that you advertise? Yeah, there's a lot of checks and balances um, in the purveying. Um, most of it, whether you believe it or not, is really in the processor, just making sure that they're keeping their facilities at the right temperatures and they're not, you know, using chlorine to clean things and then process a product on it. Um, so most of the farming side is pretty reliable. Um, there's, there's webcams, you know, you can go look and see at, really? uh, cows grazing and, uh, actual on, on real rotated forage. It's, uh, stuff oh, like that. Okay. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's also research, you know, we're always looking to get better. We just switched our pork purveyor last year, um, upgraded to a new product. So we're, we're not necessarily um, married to what we're in. We're just looking for the best. You'll, you'll follow the product, uh, the quality of the product over a, mm -hmm. a loyalty to a brand if they're not doing it right anymore. Yeah. And it's, it's constant interviewing. We're having different purveyors, different farmers, different operations come through all the time, just seeing, you know, what's available. Because not, not everything in, an, in a perfect world, you would have exactly what you want, but you have to work with what's available. Oh, man, it's so snarky. All right. So obviously, we're talking a lot about beef, but we've got chicken that's out there. You mentioned that you do pork as well. So chicken chicken's starting to really skeeve me out because they just don't look like chickens anymore. And before, you know, before we had met and before I'd realized that there was just this higher level of stuff you could get. I honestly thought that back in the day before I knew about your organization that I had to go visit all these small farmers markets, you know, and it's just not time. Um, it doesn't make sense on the time to go source your chicken from one person, run over to the other, you know, farmers market for beef and run to somebody else for something else. So 
once I found out that you guys had this available, I started shifting all my eyes away from having to go out and do that diligence myself. So I just kind of relied on, all right, the checks and balances, uh, the organization's actually looking out for us as a consumer so I can kind of rest on what I do and put my time and attention into things that I need to focus on and not just, am I poisoning my family? Am I, am I eating something that's working against us? But chicken is another one. We talked a lot about beef. What can you tell me about the chicken industry? So this thing scares the hell out of me, especially when we're talking about like, um, because when we met, we did a lot over there at the uh, the Chinese offshore trading company, you know, the uh, that, that that shall not be named. But their chickens are like four and a half pound breasts. You know, that's not the size of a chicken, right? <laughs> I mean, exactly. most, people like, most people are like, what a value. Look how big these things are. Dude, that's not right. So what can, what, the chicken scares me worse than the beef. So what can you tell us about the way chickens are raised? Yeah. So, I mean, it really, it, it again, starts with breeding, just like with, with beef. So. Heritage breeds that haven't been tampered with, um, like, like ours is a Heritage Hubbard, um, they get to three and a half pounds fully grown. So the other side of that is you have big broiler hens that have been genetically you know, bred and blown up. They get to seven pounds in 47 days. So That's that, every chicken you buy in a grocery store, the lifespan was 47 days and they went from zero to seven. Are you serious? Yeah. Technically, 7.08 pounds is the average size of a commercial broiler hen. Fully grown. But what was the lifespan? 47 days. Some hatched to the plate, 47 days. And it goes, right. up, it goes up to just under 8 pounds. Yeah. So the big problem there is when they're growing that big that fast, they can't really support their weight. So they're sitting on the floor, you know, broken bone structures. And then you've got, let's say it's free range or cage free on the package. If the chicken could not walk, who cares if it was in a cage or not? That you're not getting any oh. benefit of exercise, right? So you need a natural growth progression in the chicken where it can get to about three and a half pounds naturally, get a lot of exercise, and, and you'll see it in the macro data. I mean, it can be the difference of one gram of fat in a four-ounce serving from a chicken that actually got exercise, and then up to six in a commercial broiler hen. So that explains the differences in the labeling. Uh, actually, right. I, I was going to have that as a follow-up question, but that's... Okay. How long is a normal lifespan of a, of a well-bred chicken? Then this is just getting into the humane side. I mean, obviously you start to look at animals as noble creatures and I've started to really change my mindset on the way we're supposed to kind of coexist. I was never a real earthy environmental guy. I'm, I'm not. Um, I know I'm supposed to be. It sounds terrible, but I never really thought about the abuse at our expense you know, the, the abuse that what animals and stuff go through. And I know that my time here, um, walking around on the planet, I want to be as uh, grateful and respectful to these noble animals for what they do for us. So when I hear that something's 47 days, if there was a way to identify those kind of breeding, the, 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 uh, what'd you call them? Boiler hens. Yeah. So if there was a way to identify those, is it identified by the size? Typically that's, that's the number one indicator. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you can do a visual test um, and look for what's called white striping. So I know the, exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, the, the heavier degree of white striping, the, the worse that animal's uh, quality of life was when, when it comes to chicken. Now, what's the normal lifespan of a three and a half pounder? Um, it's, it's the same, um, for 47 days. I mean, at that point, they're going to be fully grown. It's just a, you know, the, the humane side when we're talking about that whole thing is just how you do the harvesting and how the animal lives. You know, the actual lifespan, sure, it, it would be great to, you know, have them live 10 months or, you know, whatever it's going to be. But that's, that becomes very expensive and, sure. and, and, and it's already expensive to get this kind of quality product. So that's kind of what I was saying earlier about just working with what's available and doing the best you can with all this stuff. And it's important to note that the difference between a boiler and one that's bred well is that those 47 days it's not them walking around with busted bones, Im, you know, immobile, you know, it, it gets cruel at that point. Absolutely. And yeah. And every farm that we work with is uh, Temple Grandin certified. So um, if you haven't heard of Dr. Temple Grandin, she's a famous animal welfare sciences professor uh, from Colorado State University. She was an autistic woman that developed the most humane way to raise and harvest animals. So um, Creekstone uses their methods. Um, you want to get into the details of that. It's really neat what they do. So um, they actually suspend the steer in a canvas to kind of relax the animal, simulates hugging. And then they come around a, a belt. Now, 
some people don't want to hear about this stuff. <laughs> I had to hear it to understand. Yeah, but the reality is, is this is the most humane way to do it. So they come around that funnel. They don't see the guy in front of them. It's a silent bolt gun right through the brain, instant. They don't feel anything, and it doesn't scare the next guy in line. <laughs> and what that does is it's not only the right thing to do by the animal, but it lowers the cortisol levels, the adrenaline hormones, all that stuff gets suppressed. So you have a, a better and quality product as well. You're either going to make uh, well-educated carnivores or you're going to turn people into vegans. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I yeah. mean, <laughs> but that's the whole thing, right? Like if you're going to be eating animal protein, it's the most thing you need to be the most stringent on. You, you for need sure. To, you need to know where it's coming from. And then we talked a little bit about the humane way they're treated. They are noble. They, they are serving a purpose. They're there for us. Um, but when you talked about, and again, that was one of the things you told me when we first met was processing plants can be a hysterically scary place, especially for an animal where there is a lot of stress and they are freaked out and it's not clean. It's not um, ethical. It's not moral. And when the cows die or when the, when the livestock dies with those type of chemicals in the body, it does change the quality of what you're eating then. Doesn't that make some of it tough, right? I mean, that's some of the indicators that makes things. Yeah. When you get real um, chewy, um, what's the word? Just toughness in, in meat. It's usually an animal that was under a lot of stress at the end. So pe- <laughs> I can tell when I, when I take my steak knife through, through a, a cut of beef, you know, how that animal was harvested. And that's kind of a weird thing to tell people, but you can really tell. This is, I think if consumers are smart about what they do, because people, they, they vote with their dollars. And if they, if they have the information and they know what they're doing, they're going to vote to not buy bad stuff that where animals are treated badly. Um, special interests that are fed by money instead of care. If they're voting with their dollars, that's how you stop grocery stores and the, the big wholesale clubs from carrying not just garbage, but cruel practices. So they, right. they, they need to hear it. Okay. Um, so that kind of touches on all the actual main meat sources. Now, what can you tell us about seafood? Um, there's so much misinformation as far as um, wild, um, hormone-free. Uh, there's a, you almost have to be an interpreter to understand some of the packaging. If it's a, as if it wasn't bad enough on regular organic products, what they do to fish and where they come from. Is it the same? Yeah, it's, fish is scary because it's mostly an international problem. Um, so when you get fish that kind of, it's really fishy, just doesn't look right, doesn't smell good, taste good. It's, it's been frozen and thawed several times and it deteriorates the quality. So when you have these mass fishing operations, they're catching all these fish and then they freeze them and then they ship them to China or whatever country. So, I mean, we're talking about wild caught Alaskan salmon. Yeah, it was caught there. They freeze it, send it off to cheap labor countries, lay it, debone it, refreeze it send it back to where it's going to be sold. Oh, wow. Thaw it out again to be presented as fresh. You got these, these months. I mean, sometimes your food goes all the way around the world before you eat it. So uh, that's, that's probably the biggest problem with fish. So Again, that, and, that's uh, even worse than what I thought it was. Now, what's the difference between when we're talking about um, wild caught? Because I think you had some info on that. Wild caught, uh, same kind of loophole. It's not what you think it is. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, most of the time it is wild caught. Uh, when they say it's wild caught, you hope. Um, but the, the, it's the hardest industry to get insight to because it's so shady and, and hard to just even know what's happening. So, um, things like, you know, the new wild caught versus farm raised debate is changing because of sustainability issues. And there's actually a lot of good companies that are farm raising fish in the wild. So, okay. How does that work? Gonna, so it's going to be a lot different than traditional farm raising, whether in a tank or a pond okay. and they're in still water ingesting each other's waste and bacteria, all that. If you do it in the ocean in a 15 square mile netted area, it's going to be a lot cleaner. Gotcha. Okay. And they're even doing things like uh, scallops. Now they're raising them on little boards in Texas in the ocean. So, I mean, technically that's a farm raised product. That's probably just <laughs> as good as well. Okay. That's okay. Now we, we, there's one fish that we want to steer clear of. I mean, I, I call it toilet fish. Um, it's the least, when you go somewhere and eat fish tacos, it's usually toilet fish tacos. So you, you want to <laughs> stay away from what, always ask what it is, but it's tilapia. 
And I think that's the scariest, lowest grade. Um, what kind of insight do you give on tilapia and why we need to stay away from it? Uh, well, it's a very fast populating fish uh, that'll pretty much eat anything. So that's why it's so cheap and why they farm raise it in mass production. Um, a lot of operations in Asia, they're basically raising chicken coops above the fish tanks. They feed the oh, chickens no. and the chickens feed the fish. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was a toilet fish. Yeah. So it's like, just stay away from that altogether. I don't oh, care where it comes from. There's just so many better options. You don't need to eat tilapia. Now, when you're going, uh, you're shopping for salmon, uh, this was also, I love education and I love when I learn stuff, but sockeye in particular is the one you want to look for, right? When you're, when you're um, shopping for salmon, is, is that the best? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's different breeds. I mean, king salmon is, is going to be your, your, your top end. Um, you're not going to see too much of that and it's really expensive. Um, but then you got your silver salmons, which are coho is the other name for that breed. That's an excellent breed as well. Um, same as sockeye. That's just another different wild Alaskan breed. Um, and then, you know, you get all the way down to like your chum, which is, uh, from what I've heard, there's a lot of operations that are catching chum salmon and advertising it as sockeye or coho. Oh, no way. Now, when you put these labels, especially the Alaskan based, there's, there's regulations to these things. You can't call them an Alaskan fish unless they go through like the, the whole, they've got to be like a live caught, live raised. They can't come from the farm if they're from an Alaskan source, right? Is that true? Um, across the board? Had, I'm not a hundred percent on that, but I would imagine if they had a farm in Alaska, they could say product of Alaska. Yeah. Okay. I thought that there was, um, I thought there was a tighter control on anything that said Alaskan salmon. Um, but yeah, it, for, for us, it, it's, it's just the sourcing. We use um, True North Seafood for our wild Alaskan salmon, and, and they can literally tell you what town, you know, the, the fish is awesome. Caught, so, Okay. Okay, so we're covering a lot of the, just the general consumer stuff, and obviously there's a lot for people uh, because it, do, it does come down to personal preference, what you're willing to risk and what you, what you can afford. Um, we haven't even touched on what poor farming and poor processing can do to the environment. Um, a lot of people, they talk about uh, being the environmentalist. It seems like environmental concerns as far as your cars and um, global warming. Nobody really wants to put the blame where it really should be, which is the beef industry, right? And when we start talking about the environmental impact of farming, what can you, what can you share on that? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, amazing, specifically on beef. One of the reasons why we went with uh, Matt Meyer and Thousand Hills um, for our uh, completely grass-fed pastured program, this guy is incredible. He calls himself a regenerative renegade. And I love it. <laughs> he, uh, I'm not sure what his previous business was, but he's using um, that capital to basically go in and buy, buy up GMO cornfields and convert them to grasslands and then raise cattle on them to sequester carbon. That is fantastic. So okay. basically what he was educating us on is by buying his grass fed beef and the animals, the manure, pushing the carbon into the earth, you are literally fighting global warming by eating grass fed beef. It, there's a greater risk from cars or from beef production than there is cars. And yeah, what, huge misconception. Isn't that if crazy? You got a Prius, yeah. If you got a Prius in your driveway and then you go buy commodity beef, you, <laughs> you just undid everything. Yeah, exactly. So in that kind of education, and I know there was a couple movies out there um, that one of the name escapes me, but it gets into, it's like Forks Over Knives. It might've been one of those movies that kind of really cut to the, the negative impact. Forget the cruelty. That's a serious thing. But then you're talking about the methane produced by the cows. Um, I think it, this is not right. I'm going to butcher this, but it was like 10 cows per every human on the planet. I mean, there's just that many cows. And we still have a food problem in the world. And then here they all here being, you know, poorly cared for. And then we've got the environmental impact from them. Right. So on that, so a cow is a ruminant animal. It has four stomachs. And if they're not getting the, the proper amount of grass that they naturally should eat to cleanse themselves, you know, they're not going to produce that type of methane if their diet's correct. So it's the oh. corn blasting that's creating that methane problem. So that's, it's not just that there's too many cows that are being fed wrong and that is also contributing to it. Correct. That's fantastic. Okay. Um, now traditional farms, we, we kind of touched on that. We beat it a little bit to death. Um, you guys specifically, you're using Temple Graydon, Temple Grandin. What was her name? Yeah. Dr. Temple Grandin. She's uh, basically the industry standard for humane handled and raised. 
And I'll, I will post the resources for that um, under the podcast uh, information for this. But will on that site, will they identify the ones that have been certified? So you can um, actually go and do diligence on them? Yeah. I mean, the ones who use them, they, they all brag about it on their websites. Awesome. So if you go to, to the links to any of our farms, there'll, there'll be sections on that there. Now, is this something that you have to pay for the certification or do they do it and they're like, hey, look, you can't buy me. Um, we go out and if you're good, we certify you. But uh, is, there, is there influence on this certification or is it legitimate? It's, uh, it's more so the way the facilities are designed. Um, you know, she basically designed the way to do it. So gotcha. you either use her methods or, or, or you don't. Okay. And, it's, and it is independently verified. You don't just say you're doing it. Right. Cool. Okay. All right, brother. So kind of wrapping this down. All right. We talked about a lot of scary things. We talked about um, the one thing that everyone always, the issue with organic and free range and making sure you're in the right source and all these certifications sound expensive. What advice do we have for the people that are guidance that just can't afford to go top end? Um, blessed enough that we prioritize this in our life. We, there was obviously a bump when you start committing to this type of a lifestyle, you have to transition out from traditional shopping, traditional sourcing, and we buy things in bulk now. So everything that comes in, we buy it in a shop. Um, but those that can't get that started, what kind of guidance do you have for those that just, where do they start? What, what do you want to start making your choices on? And is there a way, because if you're a single parent, you've got kids and I can't afford everything you guys are talking about. What do I do? Where do I go? Yeah, I think the first thing is just don't don't get uh, caught up in the grocery stores um, labeling marketing, so you feel like you're saving money when you're not. Um, especially, you know, if you're trying to save money to get to a healthier lifestyle, and you have to source from grocery store for now. I mean, look at the in the fine print the percentage of retained water in your chicken. I mean, if something's ninety nine cents a pound, but then it's 30% water weight. I mean, you're just buying more water. You're paying water. Yeah. Right. So I mean, water. that they still have to put on the label. It's in the fine print on any poultry pork product. Um, same thing with the, the ground percentages. It may be cheaper to buy 70, 30, but you're going to cook out 30% of it and you're going to be <laughs> it's left gonna with shrink. It's going to shrink. Right. So, I mean, really do a cost evaluation of what you're actually paying for these products. I mean, that's why we don't, our, our model is all about cost per meal, cost per serving. So I know what it costs to sit down and feed my family. Yeah, and you've got to map it out big term. Most people, though, they go shopping every week. And when you're looking at a budget, you know, on a weekly basis, it's, it's nowhere near as scary as it is buying every six months. I mean, that's where people go, holy crap. And it's like, you're spending more than that now. And it's a crappier product. So, right. Yeah, and we, we build out monthly. So it fits in with the cash flow. And the thing you got to look at is, you know, people would say, it's just a misconception that they can't afford us, but then they order Blue Apron. Well, Blue Apron, HelloFresh, these meal kit services are 10 to $15 a person. And mo most of our menus, because you're getting it in bulk, are going to break down to somewhere around 4 to $8 a person. So That's right. Yep. It's, it's definitely affordable. I mean, and most of these people who say it's not are the same people that are sometimes going to go to McDonald's or, you know, you're paying like $20 a pound for a quarter sure. pounder at McDonald's. And they never think about that because it's, oh, the meal is six, seven, eight bucks. Well, it, <laughs> I never put that together. It's a quarter pound. That's right. I never even put it together. That's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> um, okay. So you've been very good to this point. Um, you've given a lot of just industry standard. You've gave us a lot of certifications that doesn't pertain to Heartland. And you've been very good at providing information that didn't just drive us right to Heartland because you don't own these farms. These aren't your certifications. Um, so now I want to give you a chance. You got, you are local, so you're based out of Baltimore, but you serve the mid Atlantic. Um, obviously we're based mid Atlantic. That's how we met. So what's the range of, if somebody wanted to reach out, how far North, how far South do you go here in the mid Atlantic region? Um, so currently Harrisburg, Pennsylvania is the top. And then we go all the way down through the Richmond corridor and then out West through Charlottesville, Harrisonburg, even Lynchburg and, uh, out to, the eastern side, almost to the ocean, um, depending on the area. So it's basically mid-Atlantic. Um, we did just acquire another food service down in South Carolina and Charleston. So we are serving that area now. And um, we have plans to expand some more. So once that happens and we keep branching out a little further, I'll uh, update so everybody on that. You're changing lives, man. Now, if there's somebody in the Southwest, uh, do you have any any sources that you could say? Because we have some people that they are on the West Coast that listen. Is there anyone or any place they can go um, 
let's say they just have to start with the certifications. Where can they go to find sources? Do you have somebody else that you recommend that does what you do, but on the other coast? Um, unfortunately, out west, I don't. Um, there are similar services, but there's really, you know, we used to refer people to different services when they moved out of our area. And we don't do that anymore just because nobody else is really carrying the quality that we do. Um, so I, mm. it, it's really tough. I, I would say if you're, if you can't shop with us, you can order direct from some of the farms that we use, but because you're not getting it in bulk, it's very expensive. Sure. And, uh, so um, there are things like, uh, grassroots co-op. You can order some stuff from them. I think they ship nationwide. Good quality stuff. Grassroots um, co-op. Okay. Yeah, I, I ordered some of theirs just to kind of compare. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I would look for things like that. Um, don't do a butcher box. Um, I, I actually looked at them before I met you. Um, and it just didn't seem right. They didn't have any of the certifications that you were talking about. They didn't have any information on the site whatsoever. It was just like, hey, look at this prime rib. I mean, they didn't give a lot of information. <laughs> It was right. just conven- it was convenience. They're selling convenience. Yeah. What I would say to everybody is shop with people who can tell you exactly what farm the product came from. Don't worry about if it's organic or this or that. Find a source, find a person that you can trust and that you actually know what's going on. Awesome. Okay. Now, those of you that are local, uh, what's the best way to reach out to you, Justin? I don't know if you want to you give your contact info or... Yeah, absolutely. All right. Yeah, so it's uh, heartlandfoods.com. Um, you can find us on Facebook, Heartland Home Foods. You can hit me right on my cell phone, 410-458-8780. And our corporate number is 800-492-5592. Awesome. I'll add that to the notes as well. And be sure to tell them that you came through uh, Beyond the Dumbbells. Justin will hook you up because um, Justin takes care of us. Absolutely. Right. Any, any parting words or any guidance to the, to the consumer out there? You've, you've been fantastic, dude. It's a lot of great information. I even learned stuff today and I thought I was a master at, at this, at the food game here, but you actually still educated me. Yeah, honestly, I'm just humbled to be on that um, you would consider me um, for the podcast. I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I mean, my best advice to everybody is just find a person, you know, find somebody who is totally deep dive in the health and wellness that isn't one dimensional. You know, you don't know just about fitness, you know, about, all the chemicals in people's homes they need to address and you know, awesome. people with the credibility. So um, I'm happy to help. But part of the value we want to bring at Heartland and the way we train our wellness consultants is not just the food that you get from us, but help them in every aspect of their health and wellness journey so they can reach the goals that they're trying to achieve. Awesome. And do you guys have a vehicle that you put out information? Is it mostly on, is it Facebook, is it social media, or do you have any one particular um, avenue that you share most of your relative and new content? Um, yeah, it's almost all social media. Um, we are starting a blog here and, uh, yeah, website's good. Okay, sweet brother. Well, I appreciate you being on the show, homie. Um, again, thanks for all the great information, all the content that you talked about and the, uh, the web links. I'm going to add all that into the, the finer points of the post here, but, um, it's been awesome, bro. Thank you for taking the time to sit with us and, uh, educate us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I'll see you soon. You got it, brother. And thank you guys for listening to another show. We always appreciate it. We love you guys. If you've got any feedback, we'd love to hear it. Always, if you would, it's always beneficial. If you like, share, comment, that kind of keeps us juiced and lets us know we're going in the right direction. So until next time, we'll see you in the next show. Stay true, guys. Thanks for listening to the Beyond the Dumbbell Show. We know you have thousands of options for content and entertainment. We appreciate you spending time with us. If you enjoyed our show, please share our web address, www.beyondthedumbbells.com, and maybe drop us a review. Until next time, live beyond.